Welcome back everyone, I'm X Paradigm Gamer, and today it's time to look at the first installment of another awesome and popular series in the PS2. Today we're going to be looking at Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. Let's hop to it. If there's any Sony exclusive that I have any sort of nostalgic attachment to, it would likely be Sly Cooper. I never played the games when they were originally released, but my brother and I did know a pair of neighbors who owned a PS2, and the one game I actually remember them playing was Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. When I got a PS2 of my own, and I saw Sly in the list of must-haves, I was curious to see what I had been missing out on for the past 10 years. And unlike Ratchet and Clank, which I took a while to get into, I took a shine to Sly almost immediately. But that was a few years ago. Having experienced more of Sony's lineup, is Sly 1 as much fun as I remember it? Let's find out. Considering that Sly Cooper is one of the PlayStation 2's biggest franchises, it's interesting to note that it didn't come from a big-name company like Capcom or Konami, but from a little-known startup called Sucker Punch Productions. In 1997, a group of Microsoft programmers, sharing a love for video games, decided to quit their day jobs and found their own company. Setting up shop in Bellevue, Washington, the team eventually decided on the name Sucker Punch Productions and went on to develop their first title, Rocket, Robot, and Wheels, for the Nintendo 64 in 1999. Due to the moderate success of this title, Sucker Punch was able to go on to produce the Sly series. And though the series didn't sell quite as well as, say, Ratchet or Jack, it's still considered one of the PS2's best platformers, an assessment I would wholeheartedly agree with. Nowadays, Sucker Punch is pretty well known for the Infamous series, the third installment of which just landed on PS4 a couple of months ago. As a native of Washington State myself, it's nice to see a local developer like Sucker Punch share the stage with California-based Insomniac Games and Naughty Dog Incorporated. It gives me a strange sense of pride. As one Washingtonian to another, keep up the good work, guys. It's also cool that Sony's biggest developers are all from the West Coast. Suck it, New York. You've been making yourself the center of the universe for far too long. The plot is a lot heavier in backstory than Ratchet or Jack. Our main character, Sly, is a raccoon from a long line of master thieves known as the Cooper Clan. The Coopers specialize in stealing from other criminals, viewing it as a true test of their thieving prowess. Over the centuries, the Coopers have amassed a myriad of thieving techniques in the Thievius Raccoonus, an ancient book that has been passed down through the Cooper family for generations. One tragic evening, Sly's family is attacked in their own home by a gang of criminal masterminds known as the Fiendish Five who proceed to axe off his parents and steal the Thievius Raccoonus for themselves, dividing it into five different pieces and then disappearing into the darkness from whence they came. Sly is able to survive by hiding from the villains and ends up in an orphanage. It's there that he meets his lifelong friends, Bentley the Turtle and Murray the Hippo. Upon reaching adulthood, the three pals form the Cooper Gang and become one of the most notorious groups of thieves in the world, capturing the attention of ruthless Interpol inspector Carmelita Montoya Fox, who is pledged to do all in her power to bring the Cooper Gang to justice. The game begins on the rooftops of Paris. Sly breaks into Interpol headquarters and steals a case file containing information on the Fiendish Five from Inspector Fox's office. After narrowly escaping Carmelita's clutches, Sly sets off to journey to five different corners of the globe, defeat the Fiendish Five one by one, and reclaim his birthright. I enjoy the story quite a bit. I mean, the writing's not exactly the best I've ever seen, but I like what they were able to do with all of this. I like that the game can appeal to children through the anthropomorphic animal characters, while also appealing to adults through the globe-trotting locales and dark backstory. It's also got a neat coming-of-age edge to it, and that Sly has to defeat the demons of his past to overcome a rite of passage of sorts. Let's jump right into Demesthetics. An interesting thing to note about Sly Cooper right off the bat is its unconventional art direction. Unlike Ratchet or Jack, which more or less went for a more realistic but still cartoony graphical style, Sly offers something more like a comic book. This game is one of the first to utilize a rendering technique called cell shading, later made especially famous by The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Cell shading allows 3D models to render in a way similar to conventional hand-drawn animation, and Sucker Punch was able to take advantage of this technique to give the Sly series a truly unique and interesting look and feel. If I had to pick my favorite art direction of the Sony platforming trio, I wouldn't hesitate to point at Sly. In terms of the actual graphics themselves, however, the first Sly game hasn't aged that well. While the first Ratchet and Clank, and as much as I hate to admit it, Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy still look pretty nice all things considered, Sly 1 is far from one of the better looking games on PS2. The environments look nice enough and are well populated with tons of detailed set pieces, but most of the character models don't look all that great and the lighting isn't exactly the best. As for the presentation, the lip sync and voice acting are decent enough 
enough, but there's something about Sly's mouth movements that doesn't look quite right. The game also features a number of pre-rendered cartoon cutscenes, and while the sense of style is welcome, the actual execution of these cutscenes isn't exactly the greatest. I mean, look at this close-up of Carmelita. It's just flat out not well drawn. If I had to guess why there were such problems with the graphics in the presentation, I'd likely point at the budget. Sucker Punch wasn't exactly a big name developer like Naughty Dog or Insomniac, so they probably just didn't have the money to polish these elements up. Considering that, I'm willing to give this first game a free pass, especially since the graphics and presentation in Sly 2 Onward are much improved compared to this first game. While it's certainly a weakness that detracts from the experience, it's a weakness I'm willing to overlook. The music, on the other hand, is pretty good. It's not quite up to the standards of, say, Super Mario or Sonic the Hedgehog or Ratchet and Clank, but man, does it beat anything I heard in Jack 1. The soundtrack offers a large assortment of tunes, varying in both instrumentation and genre. Not only do these tracks have some pretty catchy melodies, but there are a handful in there that are pretty atmospheric as well. My favorite tracks are probably A Stealthy Approach, Into the Machine, The Dread Swamp Path, and The Swamp's Dark Center. I seriously recommend giving some of these tunes a listen, because the soundtrack in this game is woefully underrated. Let's get into DAT gameplay. You spend most of the game playing a Sly, who can double jump to cross gaps and use his cane to bash at enemies. But what makes Sly truly unique? and a million times more interesting and fun to play as than Jack and Daxter, is his ability to use a number of creative thief moves to platform about. Sly can grab onto vines and rods and climb around to reach higher ground. He can sidle up to walls and use it to sneak around guards or climb around ledges. He can jump onto narrow rails to walk on or slide around the level. He can jump on narrow points to cross gaps and can also use his cane to grab onto tires or hooks to swing over pits. And, what's more, all these platforming techniques are thoroughly polished and control exceptionally well. Sly's double jump doesn't expire. You could be an inch above the ground and it will still go off, making it incredibly useful for extending and salvaging your jumps. The platforms also don't feel space so far apart, and even if he lands at the edge, Sly will grab onto the platform and pull himself up. Unlike Jack 1, I never felt like I was constantly falling into pits and dying over and over again because of questionable level design or wonky platforming control. As Sly, your goal is to penetrate the hideouts of the different Fiendish 5 members, sneak past the guards and the security systems, reach the villains, and steal back their section of the Thievius Raccoonus. In order for Sly to reach the center of the hideouts and confront the Fiendish 5, he'll have to collect treasure keys, which allow him to unlock certain pathways. There are seven levels in each hideout, which all peter off from the main hub area. Each level contains one treasure key, so you do have to finish each level in order to reach the boss. Most of the levels are usually straightforward, requiring Sly to sneak past guards and security systems to reach the treasure key. Sly can't take that much abuse before he kicks the bucket. A single hit from an enemy will send you back to the last checkpoint, which thankfully are marked. Sly can, however, collect Lucky Charms to brace himself against a single hit. You can find them lying around the stage for free, or you can get one by collecting 100 coins. If you've played Crash Bandicoot, then it's a lot like the Aku Aku masks, even stacking up to a second hit. Unlike Aku Aku, however, Lucky Charms will also protect Sly from water, lava, or bottomless pits. Seeing as these stage hazards are usually instant kill in most platforming games, I think these Lucky Charms are a truly novel breach of custom. For some reason that I can't fathom, however, this game does have a live system. I maybe got two game overs the whole way through this game, and all it really does is send you back to the beginning of a stage anyway, so it just comes off as redundant. It doesn't really detract from anything, but I still don't think it was necessary. Because of Sly's rather limited durability. The game encourages you to sneak up on enemies from behind rather than confronting them face to face. The main guards in the hideouts have some truly awful eyesight, incapable of seeing anything that doesn't pop up in their flashlight field. What they lack in eyesight, however, they make up for in attacks, because if they spot you, they won't hesitate to nuke your ass. There are also regular enemies who will see you no matter what. Thankfully, Sly's cane is a significantly more reliable means of defense against enemies than Jack's punch and spin moves. Not only does it have a pretty wide reach, but Sly can keep swinging it until it connects with an enemy. What's also nice is that enemies can't hurt you with touch damage, so you won't be hurt by them unless if they actually attack you, which is the way it should be, seeing as Sly can't jump on enemies. Because of the functionality and stealth edge of Sly's combat, confronting enemies feels fun and interesting rather than tedious and awkward. The level design is spectacular, about as good as it could possibly get. Each level contains its own set pieces and stage hazards that help to give the game a healthy amount of variety. In the first hideout, you scale a mountain, climb around gears and machinery, and hop around a bunch of boats and airplanes. 
The way these levels are designed makes full use of Sly's moveset, so none of his abilities ever feel underutilized. What's better is that each normal level contains a varying amount of clue bottles. Think of them as this game's version of star coins and red rings, the sort of shit I always go out of my way to collect when I play my platformers. I absolutely love it when game designers give me a really good incentive to explore the level design all the way. To see all there is to see and explore all there is to explore. If you're able to find all the clue bottles in a stage, Bentley will be able to help you crack open the nearby vault, which usually contains a page of the Thievius Raccoonus. These pages will teach Sly a wide range of useful abilities, ranging from the ability to slow down time to land your jumps better, to a useful dive attack, to total immunity from water and bottomless pits. These are some of the most creative power-ups I've ever seen in a platforming game. Suffice to say, going after the clue bottles is well worth the effort. These regular levels also have a time trial mode you can do to unlock concept art and designer commentary. There are also a couple of levels in each world that take the form of minigames. Sometimes you have to control a turret to protect Murray as he scrambles up a mountain for a treasure key. Sometimes you have to take control of a hover vehicle to destroy enemy generators and blow up walls. There's even this one annoying level where you have to whack 50 chickens to help this ghost make a pot of gumbo while avoiding suicide bomber roosters. While most of these minigame levels are fun to play and the variety is appreciable, I could see some of these levels, the Murray Racing sections in particular, being really obnoxious and frustrating to the right people. One design choice that kind of irks me is that some of these minigames have a time limit, but the game doesn't tell you why the time limit is there. For some mysterious reason, if I don't light all of these tiki torches with the swamp skip within two minutes, I fail and lose a life. So tell me, game, what happens when the two minutes expire? Do I get caught by the guards? Does the earth explode in a flaming ball of gas? What is preventing me from lighting that last torch after that 120th second? Having a time limit is fine. Just offer some sort of explanation as to why the time limit exists. I know that's a nitpick and it really doesn't affect the enjoyability of the game all that much, but I still hate it when games place conditions like that without explaining it from a story perspective, and I felt the need to draw attention to it anyway. The bosses, as you might expect, are the different members of the Fiendish Five, and for the most part they're a lot of fun to fight. Certainly more fun and memorable than anything in Jack and Daxter or even the first Ratchet and Clank. Each boss is thoroughly unique and requires a different strategy to defeat. There's even one where you play this magical game of Simon Says to the death. Believe it or not, it's probably the hardest boss in the game. The only one I don't really get is the second boss. You whack these mirrors to heat up these crystals, and when you heat all of them up, the boss is damaged somehow. It's fun enough, but it doesn't exactly make much sense. On to Dem Characters. Sly Cooper is one of my all-time favorite video game characters, though his appearance in this game is far from his best. His lines and delivery feel a little subdued and restrained in this first game, where he has, he gets a lot more show-off-y and over-the-top in the second game onward. That being said, there's still a lot to like about him. He's got quite the kick-ass character design for one. Sly's also got a pretty nifty backstory, something that Ratchet and Jack wouldn't have for quite a while. It's also nice to be playing as a character that's a little more ethically ambiguous. In most other series, you play as the good guy. You save the damsel in distress, and in the end, you defeat the big bad evil guy. Sly Cooper, in many ways, is a bad guy. He's a master thief who specializes in taking what isn't his. Despite this, he won't hesitate to call people out for needless violence and cruelty. And, despite his criminal reputation, Sly makes a conscious choice to steal only from criminals. Sly has a lot of personality and charisma, and it's hard not to take a shine to him. The Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences rated Sly the best new video game character of 2002, and I can see why. Of all the platforming mascots we've seen over the past 20-something years, he's truly something special and original. I'm also a big fan of Bentley, the brains of the Cooper game. I know that some people don't really care for his voice, but I think it suits him really well. Bentley takes care of all the technology, helps Sly research his next moves, watches over him through the Not Codec, and is just all around a real smart and helpful guy. While Sly is inclined to take risks and push boundaries, Bentley is more reserved and wants to make sure that everything is carefully planned. It's fun to see these two radically different personalities bounce off of each other. If Raleigh's really as smart as his police files suggest, then that's where I'll find him. Wonderful idea, but your plan is flawed. To access Raleigh's blimp, you would have to sneak through that high voltage power tube. To do that without getting electrocuted, you'd have to destroy that power generator. And to do that, you'd need two more of Raleigh's treasure keys, which are heavily guarded. Interesting. So when are you going to get to the impossible part? Fine! But I warned you, 
For all his brains, Bentley does have an irrational fear of germs and molds that helps round him out as a character. Murray, who would later become the brawn of the Cooper gang, unfortunately doesn't get much of a chance to shine in this first game. Starting with Sly 2, Murray would get a badass upgrade and become somewhat of a fan favorite character, but in this first game, he's just comic relief. Thankfully, he's nowhere near as obnoxious as Daxter, and he never overstays his welcome. I'm looking forward to examining him some more when we get to the inevitable Sly 2 review. Inspector Fox is so much fucking fun. If only she would just stop changing her voice actor every time a new game got released. The lengths that Carmelita will go to hunt down the Cooper Gang is more than admirable, especially in Sly 3. She more than redefines the whole obsessed cop archetype we've seen so many times before. Again, I have to give credit to Sony for their excellent and well-rounded female characters. It would have been so easy to have just made her male. But not only is Inspector Fox a woman, she's no less dedicated or hardworking than any male character ever could have been. I also dare say that any scene that Sly and Carmelita share together are the best written in the game. You foolish raccoon. I've caught you red-handed. Ah, Carmelita. I haven't seen you since I gave you the slip in Bombay. Which reminds me, you need to return the Firestone of India to its rightful owners. Aha, uh -huh. and I was gonna give it to you as a little token of my- Hey, you know, that bazooka really brings out the color of your eyes. Very fetching. You think? This pistol packs a paralyzing punch. You ought to try it. Might snap you out of your crime spree. It's really the only time that we get a glimpse of the real Sly, so to speak. The Fiendish Five also could have easily been forgettable throwaway villains, but Sucker Punch did a good job giving all five of these guys their own backstories and making each one of them feel unique and three-dimensional. My favorite is probably Mugshot, who you meet in the second episode. Bullied as a kid, he turned to a life of crime as a gangster as a way of getting revenge on those who picked on him. Overall, like the Ratchet and Clank series, the Sly series benefits considerably from its charming cast of well-written and memorable characters. They're no Captain Quark, certainly, but they're certainly up there and awesome in their own right. Alright, time for the spoiler section. Ah, spoiler alert! After Sly defeats four of the five members of the Fiendish Five, Bentley is able to track down the final member, the mysterious Clockwork, to the crack Karov volcano in Russia. The Cooper Gang, riding a newly modified van with a turret and a battering ram, are able to break into Clockwork's lair. This final area is pretty damn fun if I do say so myself. As you make your way up the volcano, the platforming gradually gets more frenzied, the music begins to speed up and intensify, and the atmosphere is just brimming with finality. I don't, however, particularly care for the turret section at the beginning. You know, Murray, if you were to stop the vehicle, I would probably have more time to take out these bull- Never mind. As Sly makes his way up, he finds that Clockwork has captured Inspector Fox, using her as bait to trap Sly. Sly, feeling responsible for Carmelita's situation, attempts to free her, only to get himself caught in a gas chamber. Nice going, Sly. Bentley is able to hack the gas chamber and save the two, and Carmelita agrees to a temporary truce with Sly until Clockwork is stopped. Sly is able to make his way to the top of Clockwork's hideout to confront the robotic owl on a jetpack. Clockwork reveals that he's been the rival of the Cooper clan for hundreds of years, having replaced his organic body with a robotic one, allowing his jealousy and hate to fuel himself for centuries as he plotted to destroy the Coopers once and for all. He reveals that he intentionally let Sly live to prove to the world that the Coopers were nothing without the devious Raccoonus. The final encounter with Clockwork is easily the best final boss of the Sony platforming trio, at least as far as these first installments go. It's reasonably challenging, has a nice number of phases, and has a great sense of finality to it. Sly is able to use the jetpack to send Clockwork careening into the lava below. Sly then climbs onto his body and bashes the hell out of his head to rid himself of his arch nemesis once and for all. Maybe. With Clockwork defeated, Carmelita gives Sly a 10 second head start before she starts chasing after him again. And I can't do this cutscene justice. Just watch it for yourself. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. I felt bad leaving her stranded on that giant rock, but I knew it wouldn't be long before we'd see each other again. Hot damn, what an awesome ending. And that was Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus. And holy fuck does this game succeed literally everywhere that Jack fails. 
While Jack and Daxter the Precursor Legacy is derivative, clunky, bland, and forgettable, Sly is innovative, polished, interesting, and memorable. The controls, platforming, and game mechanics are polished, fun, and unique. The level design is creatively laid out, offers a large variety of stage hazards and set pieces, and has tons of collectibles to keep you exploring every nook and cranny. There are tons of minigames and alternate gameplay styles that keep the game from getting stale, and while every single one of them may not be fun to play, most of them are. The music, while not the best you've ever heard, is still pretty catchy and atmospheric. The characters are some of the most creative and memorable of any game I've ever played, and the plot offers a film noir inspired coming of age story that spans the entire globe wrapped up in a comic book like art style. My only real complaint is regarding the graphics, but considering the fact that this was an early PS2 title from a developer that likely had a tiny budget to work with, I'm willing to overlook that, especially seeing as the sequels are able to improve on that flaw. It's also a little on the short side, but I found that the game has quite a bit of replay value. Hell, I've given it four separate playthroughs over the past two or three years, and I've enjoyed every single one. And I've got to wholeheartedly disagree with Johnny and Matt of the Super Gaming Brothers calling Sly Cooper Crash Bandicoot with a stick, quote unquote, because these two games have almost nothing in common in terms of gameplay, story, or characters. Besides the Lucky Charms being similar to the Aku Aku Masks, or both series being Sony exclusive. And the gameplay style gets shaken up considerably in Sly 2 anyway, so that conception is just wrong, I'm sorry. It's not the best platforming game ever made, but it's certainly a fun one and more than deserves a place in your PlayStation 2 collection. If you haven't played this game yet, do yourself an enormous favor and give it a shot. Like Jack and Ratchet, you can find the PS2 versions used for about $5, and there's also an HD collection available on PS3 for about $15. Will I review the other three Sly games? abso fucking lootly I happen to really like this series, and would love to give it the full review treatment someday. But for now, I think I'd like to take a well-deserved break from PlayStation exclusives and do a couple of special videos. My next big marathon will come up soon afterwards. Until next time, I'm Exit Paradigm Gamer, and I'm feeling truly irate.